What kind of person's death could leave us feeling contented, perhaps even happy? The death of Benito Mussolini on April 28, 1945, was one of those instances. When news of his demise broke, newspaper headlines featured phrases like a fitting end to a wretched life and the man who once boasted about restoring the glories of ancient Rome now lies lifeless in a Milan public square, surrounded by an angry mob expressing their disgust through curses, kicks, and spitting. And there were few, either inside or outside of Italy, who disagreed. To understand why Mussolini's death and its aftermath were so brutal, we must understand the brutality that fueled his life and reign. In today's video, we will delve into Mussolini's rise to power, his actions while in office, and the sequence of events that eventually led to his downfall. Early Life Mussolini was born as the first child of a local blacksmith. In his later years, he took pride in his humble beginnings and often portrayed himself as a man of the people. The truth was somewhat less humble than he claimed. His father, who worked as both a blacksmith and a part-time socialist journalist, was the son of a National Guard lieutenant, and his mother worked as a schoolteacher. However, the Mussolini family did struggle with poverty. They resided in two cramped rooms on the second floor of a rundown palazzo. Due to Mussolini's father spending much of his time discussing politics in taverns and his financial resources on his mistress, their meals were often meager, especially for Mussolini and his two siblings. As a restless child, Mussolini displayed disobedience, unruliness, and aggressiveness. He acted as a bully at school and was moody at home. His behavior became such a challenge for the teachers at the village school that he was sent to live with the strict Silesian order at Faenza. Surprisingly, Mussolini's behavior worsened there. He once stabbed a fellow student with a penknife and even attacked one of the Silesians who had attempted to discipline him. Consequently, he was expelled from the Silesian institution and sent to the Giosue Carducci School in Forlimpopoli, where he faced yet another expulsion after assaulting another student with his penknife. He was also a person of intelligence, easily passing his final examinations. He even earned a teaching diploma and briefly worked as a schoolmaster but it didn't take long for him to realize that teaching wasn't his calling. At the young age of 19, he left Italy for Switzerland, a short, pale man with a strong jaw and striking dark, piercing eyes. He embarked on this journey with nothing but a nickel medallion of Karl Marx in his nearly empty pockets. Over the next few months, as he recounted, he lived day by day, taking on various odd jobs. During this time, he was also gaining a reputation as a young man with an unusual charisma and exceptional rhetorical skills. He voraciously consumed a wide range of literature, delving into the works of philosophers and theorists like Immanuel Kant, Benedict de Spinoza, Peter Kropotkin, Friedrich Nietzsche, G. W. F. Hegel, Karl Kautsky, and Georges Sorel. He absorbed what appealed to him while discarding the rest, not yet forming a coherent political philosophy of his own. Nevertheless, he left a strong impression on those around him as a potential revolutionary with an uncommon personality and a striking presence. While making a name for himself as a political journalist and public speaker, he also engaged in producing propaganda for a trade union, he advocated strikes and even violence as a means to press for their demands. He frequently called for a day of vengeance, which led to his arrest and imprisonment on multiple occasions. By the time he returned to Italy in 1904, his name had started appearing in the Roman newspapers. Upon his return, there was a period of relative obscurity. He once again took up the role of a schoolmaster, this time in the Venetian Alps, north of Udine he confessed to leading a life of moral decay during this period. However, growing weary of such a wasteful existence, he returned to trade union activities, journalism, and radical politics. This inevitably led to further arrests and imprisonment. In 1909, during a brief period of freedom, 
he fell in love with Rachele Guidi, a 16-year-old girl who was the younger of the two daughters of his father's widowed mistress. She later moved in with him in a damp and cramped apartment in Forli, and eventually became his wife. However, shortly after their marriage, Mussolini found himself imprisoned for the fifth time. By that point, Comrade Mussolini had gained recognition as one of Italy's most talented and formidable young socialists. Young, he had contributed to various socialist publications and even founded his own newspaper called La Lotta di Classi, The Class Struggle. This newspaper achieved considerable success, leading to his appointment as the editor of the official socialist newspaper, Avanti, Forward, in 1912. Under his leadership, the circulation of Avanti doubled. Mussolini used his position to vehemently oppose Italy's involvement in World War I, advocating for an anti-militarist, anti-nationalist, and anti-imperialist stance. However, his perspective shifted as he was swayed by Karl Marx's notion that social revolution often follows a war. He became convinced that the defeat of France would be a death blow to liberty in Europe, Consequently, he began writing articles and delivering speeches passionately, advocating for Italy's participation in the war, a stark contrast to his previous stance. This change led to his resignation from Avanti and his expulsion from the Socialist Party. With financial support from the French government and Italian industrialists who favored war against Austria, Mussolini assumed the editorship of Il Popolo d'Italia, the people of Italy. In this publication, he boldly articulated his new philosophy, declaring, From today onward, we are all Italians and nothing but Italians. Now that steel has met steel, one single cry comes from our hearts. Viva l'Italia! Long lay of Italy. This marked the birth of fascism. Mussolini himself joined the war effort. Rise to Power of Benito Mussolini After being wounded while serving with the Bersaglieri, a corps of sharpshooters, Mussolini returned home with a newfound conviction against socialism and a deep sense of destiny. As early as February 1918, he began advocating for the emergence of a dictator, a leader who would be ruthless and dynamic enough to tackle the severe economic and political crisis gripping Italy at the time. Just three months later, during a widely publicized speech in Bologna, he hinted that he might be the one to fulfill this role. The following year, the groundwork for a party to support his ambitious vision was laid in Milan. In a small office at Piazza San Sepolcro, around 200 individuals from various backgrounds, including Republicans, anarchists, syndicalists, dissatisfied socialists, restless revolutionaries, and discharged soldiers gathered to discuss the creation of a new political force in Italy. Mussolini named this force the Fasci di Combattimento, or fighting bands, drawing a parallel with the ancient Roman symbols of authority represented by the fasces of the lictors. It was at this moment that fascism was born, complete with its symbol. At rallies where his supporters donned black shirts, Mussolini captured the imagination of the crowds. He possessed an imposing physique, and his oratory style, characterized by its staccato and repetitive cadence, was remarkable. Although his attitudes could be theatrical, his opinions contradictory, his facts occasionally inaccurate, and his attacks sometimes malicious and misguided, his words were so dramatic, his metaphor so apt and powerful and his vigorous, repetitive gestures so remarkably effective that he seldom failed to convey his message effectively. Fascist squads, often inspired by Mussolini but sometimes organized by local leaders, swept through the countryside of the Po Valley and the plains of Puglia. They carried out actions such as rounding up socialists, setting fire to union and party offices, and instilling terror among the local population. This resulted in the humiliation, beating, or even death of hundreds of radicals. By late 1920, the blackshirt squads, sometimes with the direct assistance of landowners, 
began targeting local government institutions and obstructing left-wing administrations from taking power. Mussolini initially encouraged these squads, though he later attempted to exert control over them. Similar raids were organized in and around Milan under his direction. By late 1921, the fascists had gained control over significant parts of Italy, while the left, partly due to its post-war failures, had essentially disintegrated. The government, predominantly led by middle-class liberals, showed little resolve in combating this lawlessness. This was due to a combination of weak political will and a desire to witness the defeat of the mainly working-class left. As the fascist movement built a broad base of support around the potent ideas of nationalism and anti-Bolshevism, Mussolini began strategizing to seize power on a national scale. Mussolini's opportunity arose during the summer of 1922, when the remaining remnants of the trade union movement called for a general strike. Mussolini declared that unless the government prevented the strike, the fascists would intervene. In reality, fascist volunteers played a role in quelling the strike, thereby strengthening the fascist claim to power. On October 24th, at a gathering of 40,000 fascists in Naples, Mussolini issued a threat. Either the government will be handed to us, or we will seize it by marching on Rome. His impassioned speech stirred the assembled fascists, who enthusiastically took up the cry, chanting, Roma, Roma, Roma. It was clear that they were eager to embark on this march. Later that day, Mussolini and other prominent fascists made a crucial decision. They planned that four days hence, the fascist militia would initiate a march towards Rome, using converging columns led by four prominent party members who would later be recognized as the Quadrum Viri. Interestingly, Mussolini himself was not among the four chosen leaders. At that point, Mussolini still held hope for a political resolution, and he was unwilling to mobilize his forces until King Victor Emmanuel III formally summoned him in writing. Meanwhile, across Italy, fascists were gearing up for action, and the march on Rome commenced. Although it was less orderly than what fascist propaganda would later portray, it posed a significant enough threat to the existing government. King Victor Emmanuel III, open to the fascist alternative, finally dispatched the awaited telegram that Mussolini had been anticipating. Dictatorship. Mussolini's evident pride in becoming the youngest prime minister in Italian history on October 31, 1922, was well-founded. While he undoubtedly benefited from a favorable blend of political and economic circumstances, his remarkable and swift rise to power also stemmed from his personal traits, native instincts, sharp calculations, shrewd opportunism, and exceptional abilities as a persuasive speaker. Eager to prove that he was not only the leader of fascism, but also the head of a unified Italy, Mussolini presented the king with a list of ministers, a majority of whom were not affiliated with his own party. However, he made it clear that he intended to govern with a firm hand. He successfully secured full dictatorial powers for a year, during which he passed a law that allowed the fascists to solidify their dominance in parliament. While the 1924 elections were unquestionably marred by fraud, they effectively cemented his personal hold on power. Mussolini's authority found favor with many Italians, particularly within the middle class. They had grown weary of strikes and unrest, and they were drawn to the flamboyant style and historical imagery of fascism. They were willing to accept a dictatorship as long as it promised to stabilize the national economy and restore their country's dignity. To them, Mussolini appeared as the man capable of bringing order to the chaos. Under Mussolini's leadership, a semblance of order was indeed reestablished, and the fascists embarked on ambitious public works projects. However, the price of this order was exceedingly high. Italy's fragile democratic system was dismantled in favor of a one-party state. Opposition parties, labor unions, and independent media were all outlawed. 
Free speech was brutally suppressed, with a network of spies and secret police closely monitoring the population. This repression impacted not only socialists, but also moderate liberals and Catholics. In 1924, Mussolini's associates kidnapped and murdered Giacomo Matteotti, a socialist deputy who had become one of fascism's most articulate critics in Parliament. The Matteotti crisis rattled Mussolini, but he managed to maintain his grip on power. Mussolini received lavish praise from prominent figures across the globe, with many hailing him as a genius and a superman. His achievements were often seen as nothing short of miraculous. He had effectively revitalized and unified a previously divided and demoralized Italy, implemented social reforms and public projects while maintaining the support of industrialists and landowners, and even managed to establish a working relationship with the papacy. However, the actual situation was far less optimistic than the propaganda suggested. Significant social divisions persisted, and little progress had been made in addressing the deeply entrenched structural issues within the Italian state and economy. Mussolini could have remained a revered figure until his death, had it not been for his callous xenophobia, arrogance, misunderstanding of Italy's core needs, and imperial ambitions that drove him to seek foreign conquests. His initial target was Ethiopia, and after ten months of preparations, filled with rumors, threats, and hesitations, Italy invaded the country in October 1935. This marked the beginning of a brutal campaign of colonial conquest, during which the Italian forces deployed tons of gas bombs against the Ethiopian population. Europe expressed its shock and condemnation, but little more. The Ligue of Nations imposed sanctions, although they carefully excluded certain exports like oil to avoid provoking a European war. Mussolini had openly stated that if oil sanctions were imposed, he would have to withdraw from Ethiopia within a week. However, no such sanctions were imposed, and on the night of May 9, 1936, Mussolini announced to an enormous crowd of approximately 400,000 people gathered around Piazza Venezia in Rome that Italy had achieved its empire in the 14th year of the fascist era. This moment likely represented the zenith of public support for his regime. Italy had forged a new alliance, with Adolf Hitler actively supporting Mussolini's imperial ambitions in Austria. With Hitler's guidance, Germany stood as the one powerful nation in Western Europe that did not oppose Mussolini. This paved the way for the Pact of Steel, solidifying the Rome-Berlin axis and forming a brutal alliance between Hitler and Mussolini, a partnership that would ultimately lead to their downfall. In 1938, taking a cue from Germany, Mussolini's government enacted anti-Semitic laws in Italy, which subjected Jews to discrimination in various aspects of public and private life. These laws set the stage for the deportation of approximately 20% of Italy's Jewish population to German death camps during the war. Role in World War II of Benito Mussolini Mussolini recognized the importance of maintaining peace for Italy's well-being and the potentially disastrous consequences of a prolonged war. He was also aware of the need to avoid blindly aligning with the Germans. However, he had concerns that the Germans might secure advantageous deals and that by not joining them in World War II, Italy could miss out on its share of the rewards. Mussolini's foreign secretary and son-in-law, Count Galeazzo Ciano, documented a lengthy and inconclusive discussion at the Palazzo Venezia, where Mussolini initially leaned towards avoiding war, but later felt compelled by honor to align with Germany. Mussolini closely observed Hitler's war progress with growing bitterness and concern. With each German victory, his bellicose rhetoric increased, and he secretly hoped that the Germans might face setbacks that would alleviate his personal envy and provide Italy with some breathing room. However, as Germany continued its westward advance and France appeared on the brink of collapse, Mussolini felt compelled to act. On June 10, 1940, Italy made the fateful declaration of war. 
Unfortunately for Italy, the war did not go as Mussolini had opportunely envisioned, and his hopes for a swift victory quickly evaporated. France surrendered before Italy had the chance to achieve even a minor triumph, prompting Mussolini to meet with Hitler. During this meeting, he reluctantly acknowledged that his opinions held only consultative value. It became increasingly evident that Mussolini was the junior partner in the Axis alliance. The Germans deliberately concealed most of their military plans, revealing them only when they had already been executed to maintain the element of surprise. Consequently, Mussolini was often left in the dark about significant German actions, such as the occupation of Romania and the subsequent invasion of the Soviet Union, receiving no advance notice. Mussolini openly admitted that he decided to attack Greece through Albania in 1940 without informing the Germans as a way to pay back Hitler in his own coin. However, this decision resulted in a significant and humiliating defeat. Reluctantly, the Germans had to intervene to rescue him from the consequences of this ill-fated move. In 1941, Italy's campaign to support the German invasion of the Soviet Union also ended in disaster, subjecting thousands of poorly equipped Italian troops to a nightmarish winter retreat. Once again, Hitler had to come to his allies' aid, this time in North Africa. Following the Italian surrender in North Africa in 1943, the Germans began to take precautions in anticipation of a likely collapse of the Italian regime. Mussolini had greatly exaggerated the level of public support for his government and the war effort. When the Western Allies successfully invaded Sicily in July 1943, it became abundantly clear that the collapse of Italy was inevitable. How did Benito Mussolini die? By the spring of 1945, Europe had seen the end of the war, and Italy lay in ruins. As Allied forces advanced through the battered southern regions, many believed that the blame for Italy's condition rested squarely on the shoulders of Mussolini. However, apprehending Mussolini was no longer a practical option. Even though Hitler found himself surrounded by Allied troops in Berlin, Italy was not willing to take any more chances with its fate. On April 25, 1945, Benito Mussolini agreed to a meeting with anti-fascist partisans at the Milan Palace. It was during this meeting that he received the news that Germany had initiated negotiations for his surrender, sending him into a furious rage. Mussolini decided to flee north with his mistress, Clara Patacci, and they joined a German convoy en route to the Swiss border. Mussolini believed that this would offer him a chance to live in exile and avoid capture. However, he was mistaken. In an attempt to disguise himself, Mussolini donned a Nazi helmet and coat within the convoy. Yet, his instantly recognizable appearance, with a bald head, strong jaw, and piercing brown eyes, betrayed him. Over the past 25 years, Mussolini had cultivated a cult-like following and had become easily identifiable due to his ubiquitous presence in national propaganda. Now this recognition worked against him. Fearing that the Nazis might stage another rescue attempt for Mussolini, partisans swiftly moved him and Patacci to a remote farmhouse. The following morning, the partisans ordered the couple to stand against a brick wall near Villa Belmonte, close to Italy's Lake Como, and a firing squad unleashed a hail of bullets, ending their lives. In his final moments, Mussolini's last words were a desperate no, no. Mussolini had come perilously close to reaching Switzerland. The picturesque town of Como shared a border with the neighboring country. Just a few more miles and Mussolini might have achieved his escape. Mussolini's tumultuous life had abruptly reached a violent conclusion. Yet the end of Mussolini's life did not mark the end of the story. The partisans, still unsatisfied, proceeded to gather 15 individuals suspected of being fascists and executed them in a similar manner. Adding to the tragedy, Clara's brother, Marcello Petacci, met his demise while attempting to escape by swimming in Lake Como. The enraged mobs were far from finished. How Mussolini's corpse, 
was mutilated after his death. On the night following Benito Mussolini's death, a cargo truck roared into Milan's square of the 15 martyrs. Ten men unceremoniously unloaded 18 bodies from the back of the truck, including those of Mussolini, the Patachis, and the 15 suspected fascists. This square had a grim connection to the past, as a year earlier, Mussolini's forces had brutally executed 15 anti-fascists there. The residents of Milan, mindful of this dark history, vented two decades of frustration and anger on the lifeless bodies. The crowd began by hurling rotten vegetables at Mussolini's corpse, then escalated to physically assaulting it, beating and kicking it. One woman, driven by a profound desire for retribution, fired five close-range shots into his head, one for each of her sons lost in Mussolini's ill-fated war. This gruesome spectacle only further inflamed the crowd's emotions. A man even lifted Mussolini's body by the armpits so that everyone could see it more clearly. However, this still wasn't enough for the enraged mob. Ropes were brought out and tied to the feet of the corpses, and the lifeless bodies were hung upside down from the iron girders of a nearby gas station. The crowd chanted, Higher! Higher! We can't see! String them up! To the hooks! Like pigs! Mussolini's mouth remained agape, even in death, refusing to be silenced, while Clara's lifeless eyes stared blankly into the distance. The Aftermath of Mussolini's Death News of Benito Mussolini's death spread rapidly, and it had a profound impact on Adolf Hitler. Hitler, who learned of Mussolini's demise through the radio, was determined not to meet the same fate as his Italian counterpart. Those close to Hitler reported that he declared, This will never happen to me. In his final will, hastily scribbled on a piece of paper, Hitler expressed his desire not to fall into the hands of an enemy who would turn his death into a spectacle orchestrated by the Jews for the entertainment of their fervent masses. Just days after Mussolini's death on May 1st, Hitler took his own life along with his mistress. As Soviet forces closed in, his inner circle incinerated his remains. As for Benito Mussolini's fate, the story was not yet concluded. On the afternoon of the gruesome desecration of the corpses, American troops and a Catholic cardinal arrived on the scene. They transported the bodies to the local morgue, where a U.S. Army photographer documented the macabre condition of Mussolini and Patachi. Eventually, the pair found their rest in an unmarked grave in a cemetery in Milan. However, the location of Mussolini's burial didn't remain a secret for long. On Easter Sunday of 1946, fascists exhumed Mussolini's body. They left a note indicating that the fascist party could no longer tolerate the cannibalistic insults from individuals organized within the Communist Party. Four months later, the corpse reappeared in a monastery near Milan. It remained there for 11 years until Italian Prime Minister Adone Zoli returned the remains to Mussolini's widow. She finally gave her husband a proper burial in the family crypt in Predapio, but the story of Mussolini's death doesn't end there. In 1966, the U.S. military handed over a portion of Mussolini's brain to his family. The military had previously removed a section of his brain for syphilis testing, although the results were inconclusive. In the end, Benito Mussolini's life and death left an indelible mark on history from his rise to power through propaganda and force to his gruesome demise. His story serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of extreme ideologies and unchecked power. What are your thoughts on Mussolini's legacy and the events surrounding his death? Share your opinions and historical insights in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more fascinating historical narratives and insights. Until next time, bye.